The discussion today is the European Emission Trading System, uh, which is the, I would say, by far and away the most important cap and trade system that exists in the world. Uh, and there are two ways to look at the EU ETS. The first, we could look at it as just a cap and trade system, uh, as if it were in a unitary state and something that could be implemented in the United States. And many people have looked at it in this respect, and it is quite often criticized or viewed from that standpoint. But a second, I would say less appreciated and equally, if not important, more important aspect of the EUTS is that it is a multinational system. And it is the world's first multinational cap and trade system. And I will talk about that uh, as we uh, go through the discussion this morning. The latter aspect is what evokes the subtitle of my talk which is path to the future or dead end. And that dichotomy describes not so much the fate of the EU ETS, although that too, but more importantly, the prospects for an effective global climate regime. For the EU ETS promises an eventual global system, but that whole prospect has been called into question by the developments in the US with respect uh, to cap and trade. So let's proceed with the, just I'll, I'll provide an assessment of the six plus years now that the European system has operated and then wrap up with some comments on the path to the future, the dead end, and we'll have uh, some time for Q's and A's at the end. So let me describe just very briefly the main features of the EU ETS. It is a classic cap and trade system in that emissions, there's a cap, an absolute limit put on emissions over the regulated sources uh, over some geographic area, in this case, the 27 member states of the European Union. Uh, allowances or rights to emit are issued in some manner and you know spent by mostly free allocation in the European system and then a requirement is imposed upon the regulated sources that they must monitor and report emissions and surrender those allowances equal to their emissions. It is different from the type of cap and trade programs that we know in the United States in having a highly decentralized implementation that of course reflects its multinational character. So although there are certain coordinating features about how the system was set up, every member state is responsible for enforcement, the reporting, many of the rules are, uh, are implemented individually uh, by the member states. And at least as currently and when the system started out, even the absolute cap was really the sum of 27 caps rather than an EU-wide cap, which it will be uh, starting in 2013. The coverage of the system is for what we would call large stationary sources, that is electric utilities and large industry, uh, iron and steel, cement, refineries, glass and ceramics, pulp and paper, uh, anything that is, uh, would qualify as a large source. Quite significantly, aviation is being added, aviation emissions are being added in 2012. Not only for aviation or flights within the European Union, but for all flights originating or ending in the European Union. So when you fly to Europe or you go to Paris for your next vacation, uh, you know, start after 2012, then the emissions from uh, that flight from New York or Los Angeles will indeed be covered by the European Emission Trading System.
The system is set up in a series of multi-year periods, uh, sequential multi-year periods, uh, for which the cap is declining in each period. And the legislation or the directive establishing the system was originally set up for two periods from 2005 to 2007, what was characterized as a trial period. It was to sort of get things, uh, the institutions worked out and the kinks worked out of the system. And that was to lead to what you could call at least the initial real trading period 2008-2012, which corresponded to the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol and for which the European Emission Trading System was one of the primary instruments and the central instrument in the European Union for meeting the obligations of the member states uh, under the Kyoto Protocol. Last year, or two years ago, the initial directive was amended to establish a third trading period, for, which will be an eight-year period starting in 2013, running through 2020. Uh, and it further specified that after 2020, although the presumption is there will probably be further amendments and changes, uh, that uh, at least the intent and the, the law as it reads now is that that cap will decline by 1.74% per annum uh, from 2020 on. And if you work that out, uh, it will uh, lead to a level of emissions in 2050 that will be approximately 50% below 2005 emissions, which are roughly speaking business as usual emissions. And of course, assuming growth would be a larger reduction than what one might predict to be emissions in 2050 without the system. This is the first cap and trade program which allows significant amount of offsets into the system. Uh, and by that means, it is allowing the effect of the price created in Europe to be extended beyond Europe and to justify economically emission reductions outside of the European Union uh, that could, given the nature of the problem here, are as effective as, as or in terms of the global warming effect as reductions made in Europe. There are two limits on the use of offsets. The first is that they can be no more than 13% of total emissions. So in some sense, you could say the cap has perhaps been increased by that, but then that depends upon the supply and the actual use of that. And it's also limited to only the trading mechanism set up by the Kyoto Protocol, namely the clean development mechanism and the joint implementation mechanisms that were set up under that. So it's not any offset. It would not include, for instance, the sort of offsets if in your air travel you neutralize your, your you know, or a carbon neutral meeting, those sort of offsets are not accepted because of their more dubious uh, uh, nature. Finally, allocation, uh, the allocation of the allowances, which is what makes these systems work, or the currency by which they, they operate, uh, was free allocation to the emitting sources initially, as have been all other cap and trade systems. However, uh, the European system has really established the principle then evolving to full auctioning, uh, which is due to occur uh, by 2026. And will start in a major way, will be phased out completely for electric utilities in 2013, for industrial sources uh, slower, but by 2027, in theory, everything will be uh, fully auctioned. Let's look at emissions, sort of what has been the effect of this. The black line here reflects, the, black, the solid black line reflects emissions since 1990 and through 2009. Uh, of the sectors of the installations that are included within the European Emission Trading System. And you can see the huge decline in 1990. These red lines are the three caps. That's the first three-year period. This is the current five-year period, which they're in. This is the cap that starts in 2000 and, uh, uh, 2013. Now, there's several features to notice. First is that the reductions are quite modest. This, incidentally, this, this dashed line is an estimate of what emissions would have been, what economists would call counterfactual emissions, or what the emissions would have been without the price on carbon. And the distance between the solid line, which is measured, observed emissions, and this estimate of what would have been constitutes the reduction that we can attribute to the price of carbon and to the system. And you can see that's quite modest in the early years. In this period, the cap was set at pretty much what emissions would have been and were largely expected to be. 
Uh, and you see a large reduction that took place in 2009. A good part of that was, of course, due to the recession, but you'll notice emissions would have reduced anyway. And what you see is a much bigger reduction took place in effect, which reflects the coming online of investments and the delayed effect of investments that were made during, started during the first period, but of course those investments take time to take effect, and that is a further effect of the price, that even though you did not see that in the first period, you're seeing larger reductions now. The emissions data for 2010 will be released the day after tomorrow, so we don't know what that is. We might see a bounce up, but there can be no question about the direction of what emissions in Europe in these regulated sectors are going to be in the future. They will, they're coming down, and they will continue uh, to go down as you see here. And I would argue this will be typical of greenhouse gas emission limitation programs or cap and trade programs. The U.S. proposals that failed last year in Congress had very much the same characteristic. The cap starts out pretty much at or a little below current emissions and then gets tighter over time. Of course, the whole purpose is to create the price and then to give the price, which will provide, drive the uh, innovation uh, investment <coughs> in innovation. Here's what the price of allowances has looked like over this period of time. There are two price lines here. The first one, the red, is the price for the first period, the trial period, and the blue line represents the second period prices. Now these prices are the next futures contract. The main sort of market development in the European system has been that the futures, the main market is in the futures that settle in December of every year prior to when allowances have to be surrendered uh, in March and, and April. The first period, this first period price you will see ended up being zero. And this reflects, it started out fairly modest, and you can see the evolution, but this reflects the fact that the way the system was designed, which was that the first period was to be completely walled off from anything else. This was a trial period, it was outside of the Kyoto Protocol. And the intent was, and the fear was, when things were set up, and the reason for the trial period is if anything went wrong, there was an excess of emissions or allowances, and rather than have to pull them back and so on, that they would simply wall off so that the real period would, of course, start in the second period. Now, futures were sold. This zero price has drawn a lot of attention. But notice that during all of this period through here, the second period price never went to zero. It got as low as a little under 14 during that period of time, but it was generally around about 20 euros, which was signaling what people expect to be the price in the second period. And of course, at midnight, December 31st, 2007, the price flipped the current price for emissions, went from zero to something like, as you can see, around 20 euros a ton. That involved some inefficiencies, but still the long-term effect was what you see. The second thing you'll see is that this price changes, and it reflects, largely speaking, most of the occurrences and the big shifts you can see here reflect changes of expectation with respect to the conditions that will affect emissions. So most notably, you can see at the end of 2008, now, the European Union allowance price was not the only price that fell during this period. All of you, if you had any portfolio holdings, value of houses, whatever, you'll have experienced much the same sort of thing, and all asset and many prices went down during that period, and that simply reflect the fact of economic growth was not going to be as much, and with a fixed cap, then there'd be less demand for permits and a lower price, which you can see prevailing over this period compared to there. And we can look at other periods. This is the tightening as the phase two cap was determined, or the second phase cap was determined. You saw a general tightening. There was tremendous uncertainty about the level of emissions in Europe. The inventories were very poor. So you can see prices started out, sort of what people predicted, but very quickly became high. When the first reporting of emissions took place here, you had in a one-week period a literal halving of the price that showed that, in fact, emissions were much lower than what people had expected. And of course, for the first period, it went on to zero because there was a small surplus of allowances in the end. But the second period price started separating at that point because everyone knew that that cap was going to be different and tighter and would not be slack in the same sense. And beyond this period, in the future periods, banking is, is allowed, so that will not uh, be a problem. The price is volatile. 
but there are measures and degrees of volatility. All prices are volatile. If you want to make a comparison, the price of European Union allowances is comparable to that for crude oil. It's more volatile than the price of coal, but it's less volatile than the price of natural gas or electricity if you use the technical measures uh, for volatility. Here's a picture of what trading volumes have been in this market. So it started off fairly low level, and you can see a steady increase in the amount of trades that took place. These are quarterly figures to where in 2009 it had stabilized at a level of about 4 billion tons or 4 billion allowances traded annually uh, and has been there for the last two years. Now, by comparison, you say the annual cap is about 2 billion tons. So you can see that you're having, in what looks like sort of a stabilization of the amount of trading, you're seeing a number of allowances, roughly two times the level of the cap being traded. Now, of course, any given allowance may trade several times. These are futures, so they're not all just trades pertaining to allowances in 2009, but you can see anyway the growth of the market there. And also in terms of composition, this green are the exchanges. These are allowances traded through over-the-counter markets, and this is through exchanges, which started out very small, most everything traded through over-the-counter as allowances are traded in the United States. Exchanges are more sophisticated, deeper sort of financial market, which is developed in Europe for allowances. Uh, we haven't seen those uh, in the United States. I said also that uh, this was the first system which has a major reliance on offsets, which has extended the influence of the European price worldwide to anyone who wished to reduce emissions under the clean development uh, mechanism, the Kyoto Protocol. We have only two years of observation. This really got started in 2008. But there have been some surprises. So the greatest has been, you'll recall, if you've ever worked in offsets, there are always these fears about we've got to limit the amount of offsets because they'll collapse the system and people will buy them. These offsets are several euros cheaper than European Union allowances. Yet what we've observed in these two years is that only 4% of the emissions have been covered, one-third of the amount that's actually permitted legally under the system, the 13%. So it's a, uh, you know, this has been somewhat of a conundrum, a puzzle as to why uh, we don't see greater use of these uh, offsets, which are perfectly substitutable for union, European Union allowances and which are cheaper. Uh, about 20% of the installations have actually used offsets. Surprisingly, the highest use of offsets has been up among the industrial sources and not the electric utilities, who tend to be the most active participants in the market and who had been expected to be the ones who would principally use it. In these two years, approximately 42% of the CDM credits that were available on the market were surrendered in the European Union system. The rest of these, you remember there are other, there's other demand for CDM credits, namely governments meeting their obligations under the Kyoto Protocol, such as Japan notably, but others including within the European Union, those that are, that are above, such as uh, Spain and, and some others. And the composition of supply, in other words, the, the credits surrendered in Europe pretty, look pretty much the same as the supply of these credits, which are coming, most importantly, from China, about 40% uh, from China, and a total of another 30% from the combination of India, South Korea, uh, and Brazil. Now, one of the things that most interesting aspects of the European system has been what I would call the absence of economic effects. And the introduction of cap and trade systems are always accompanied by enormous fears expressed concerning the macroeconomic effects and the trade or leakage effects of putting a price on carbon when other countries uh, don't have it. In the US, we've heard terms such as the more heated rhetoric of, you know, CO2 price would wreck the American economy. In Europe, the extreme formulations were this system would start the deindustrialization of Europe, uh, and these effects were confidently ex expected. In fact, we have not seen much effect at all. The first three years of the program, or up through 2008, were relatively robust years of economic growth in Europe. And of course, they suffered in the Great Recession just like everyone else. But no one has attributed that 
recession, some three to four years after the carbon price was imposed on the carbon price in Europe, equal effects, if not greater effects, occurred in the United States where there was no carbon price. And the ugly truth is, of course, that subprime mortgages in the US had a greater effect on European macroeconomic performance than a carbon price in Europe. I mean, that it's hard to argue. I find it hard to argue with that. Uh, but no one was concerned about subprime mortgages in Europe, in, in Europe least of all. Uh, but there was the great concern of carbon price, which simply was not there. The trade effects have also been imperceptible. So when you look, when we wrote the, the book on the first three years of pricing carbon that Charlie referred to, uh, we looked a lot at these sort of trade effects and particularly at the net import figures. So if there's going to be leakage or the carbon price has an effect, you would expect that, okay, you'd see an increase of imports and perhaps fewer exports because the exports are carrying, the carbon price would cause imports to increase and exports uh, to decrease. And in some of these areas, and some for some products, the carbon price isn't that important, but others like cement, it is quite important, and steel as well. And what you see when you look at that is a continuation of past trends. Whatever the trend in net imports had been before 2005, that's what it became. That's what it was in the years, immediately the years that we looked at uh, after 2005. And in fact, these were years of increasing production in Europe, notwithstanding a carbon price, until, of course, the Great Recession hit. And the question would be, why do we not see these effects when you would think that a carbon price would? And my explanation for this is a carbon price is just one price among many. And so that the industrial location, the industrial activity, in its location and its level of production or its level of activity are determined by probably hundreds of prices, if you want it, and various considerations that determined what it would be as of 2005. And all of those other prices remain as valid after 2005 as they were before and as determining an influential, if not more influential, in terms of location and production as the price of carbon, which is just one more price. And it also points out but what we say, so we don't see these economic effects. Now, I don't want to say that it didn't have any effect because as you saw before, emissions have been limited and they're being reduced, and, they've been re and they were reduced uh, even from the beginning. So what we see here and what we're discovering is that the emissions involved in production are increasing and not the production. There's not a fixed relationship between carbon emissions, or energy use for that matter of fact, and output. And the effect of the carbon, the primary effect of the carbon price is in fact to change and cause people to seek more carbon efficient ways or less carbon using ways to produce. And of course that has cost effects. How those get passed on is a complex issue uh, in terms of elasticities, all sorts of other things. But what we observe is it doesn't have the employment, it doesn't have the trade effects or the macroeconomic <laughs> effects that are oftentimes experienced. And in fact, if you've been to Europe since 2005 and you were there before 2005, I dare say you didn't observe any difference in terms of the uh, of how Europe looked and how people were behaving, but emissions were lower, modestly so, as you can see. So let's summarize here on uh, what are the achievements of, let me just wrap this part of it up with what are the achievements uh, of the EU uh, ETS. And I would characterize these, I think, if we uh, pull back up to the largest or the biggest picture, is three. Uh, there is a price on carbon over roughly 10% of global emissions. The reductions have been modest so far, as I have said, but what has been established is pervasive signal and an imposition of cost that enters into production decisions and consumption decisions, uh, but importantly is this signal for investment and in innovation which will have the effects in the future and that as with the declining cap, one can reasonably anticipate what will be a higher price, although the level of that price is, of course, not known. That depends upon the level of economic activity, uh, what happens in these areas. More importantly than this price, that price I would, as an economist, I would place great importance on that, 
But what you see is a mechanism in place for affecting further greenhouse gas emissions as desired. This is something that no other nation or no other set of nations has in place an effective mechanism that is, of course, there will be further political decisions on what level of emissions, where will we establish the cap, but that system is in place, it's been institutionalized, it's established, and uh, of course the path that it's set up is quite clear, it may be changed, but still it is there. And most importantly, it has demonstrated the feasibility of a multinational system, very much as was anticipated in the Kyoto Protocol. Now that raises the question, can we consider the EU ETS a model for the world, for the globe, with all of its disparities and differences? And I would say yes, I think we should at least consider that and think about that. And I would make that argument based upon two observations in particular. First of all, the, the European Union is not a strong federal state. And it would be, I would say, the found, as the European Union exists today and the various founding treaties, it would really, if you wanted to seek a U.S. analogy, it would be more like the Articles of Confederation than the post-Civil War U.S. Constitution, as we have evolved it, where we, although states enjoy a fair degree of autonomy, and we are a federal state, uh, the grandest state in the United States, be that California, Texas, New York, could not pretend to the sort of sovereignty and discretion that the smallest state and the least important of the European member states uh, enjoys. And although the legislation that what we would consider legislation that operates at the European level are called directives and appear to be like federal legislation, these, I would suggest, functionally should be regarded more as multinational agreements. For although there's a European Parliament which has a role to play, and there's the Commission and various officers of the European Union, a directive can pass only if there is a supermajority of the participating governments, and in many instances, such as in fiscal matters, it must be the unanimous agreement of the, the member states with under a sort of a weighting scheme, but it requires a supermajority of that uh, weighting. So it really is when these governments decide, then that becomes a directive which will be transposed and so on. So it is a type of multinational agreement. And although it may be convenient for Americans and others to speak of Europe as an entity, and regarding it as somewhat homogeneous, I would submit that it is not, particularly in this area. The economic disparities are large. If you look at per capita income levels, let's say purchasing power, parity basis, they differ by a factor of five between the lowest income nations, which are Romania and Bulgaria, and the highest income nation, which is Ireland that has a per capita income comparable to that of the U.S. average. Now the comparable spread in the United States between the richest and the least you know, wealthy or least uh, or highest income, one with the lowest gross state product is a factor of two. So we're looking at disparity which is considerably larger than we observe in the United States. And that span comes pretty close to the range spans almost the global average. The per capita income levels, again on purchasing power parity basis of Bulgaria and Romania is only 50% higher than that of China. And as I said before, Ireland is comparable uh, to, to the US average. Different parts of Europe have had quite different historical experience with markets. We might have thought before 1990 in terms of, well, Southern Europe is not quite as market-oriented as the Netherlands, the UK, Scandinavia, and so that you could imagine a market-based system operating in Northern Europe or the Northern part of Western Europe, but it was less possible to see that in the, in the South. But then after the adhesion of the new member states of Eastern Europe that came into the European Union, we're now talking about countries that until 20 years ago had literally no experience with market-based, in fact, had economic systems that for some 40 years had been based on uh, a denial of the role of markets. 
Uh, and, you, and so we do have the same sort of uh, differences that we might think of, institutional differences with respect to markets that we might think of existing on a global level. And I would be quick to note that the commitment to climate policy varies widely among the European nations. So in Eastern Europe, the emphasis is on what we would call conventional pollutants, sulfur dioxide, particulates, NOx emissions. Yes, they're concerned about climate, but the imperative environmental need is really to deal with the conventional pollutants, which they're doing, and climate is somewhat a little bit later, whereas of course in Western Europe, for the most part, these have all been, the conventional pollutants are very well under control, have been dealt with, and they can be much more, and tend to be much more concerned with climate policy. So in many ways, the East-West divide, although it's not identical and it's perhaps not as great, it resembles the global North-South differences. And yet, the remarkable feature of the European emission trading system, this first multinational cap and trade system, is that all 27 member states belong despite these many differences uh, among them. On a global level, we don't require that all 180 nations of the United Nations belong. We certainly need the major emitters, but constructing a system that will have those, all of those major emitters is going to require dealing with the problems that they've had to deal with in Europe. So the question is, what really made it work in Europe? So what lessons can we draw in terms of a future global system that would be a multinational system uh, that what can we draw from? One, of course, is the will to act. That goes without saying. But I think equally importantly is the favorable political moment. It seems to me questionable. One could question whether the European Union would have enacted the system if it were today. When the preeminent European institution, the euro, is under attack and has absorbed everybody's attention. This system is sort of off on the sides and so on, but it was created I mean, it was formally adopted in 2003, first proposed in 2001, at a time of growing optimism in Europe and confidence in their ability to act together. And, and of course, environmental it is given a tremendous impetus by the U.S. rejection of the uh, Kyoto Protocol, ironically, which then moved them towards trading. So there was a favorable political moment, of course, all Political achievements require a favorable political moment, uh, almost by definition. A second feature of the made work is great initial deference to the member states. There were particular checks that were put in place, and as the system got going, there was increasing centralization later on, in some ways because some of the things that member states had insisted upon initially, such as allocating allowances, they found to be a thankless task and were happy to have it done. Uh, in a number and by you know, some other means. But initially, it was very much so. As I said before, the initial cap and the current cap is the sum of 27 individually nationally determined caps that are subject to some review and sort of coordination of criteria and so forth that are laid out in the international, the directive or international agreement that sets up the system. But uh, it is very decentralized uh, it, in its implementation as well as in the fundamental features of the beginning of what's the size of the cap. It benefited enormously from the pre-existing coordinating mechanisms that existed in the European Union. The commission, the whole jungle of committees and other institutions that are set up to encourage cooperation and to work out issues among the member states. None of these were set up for a cap and trade system in Europe, but they played the role brilliantly and I think quite, quite well. Uh, but those mechanisms were in place, so they didn't have to be created. And obviously, in a global system, you're going to have to create those. We're going to have to find the mechanisms that would allow that, those sort of coordinating functions to take place. Equally important were the, the pre-existing club, what I would call the club benefits of the European Union. So anyone familiar with the system will know that the East European member states are not necessarily enthusiastically happy about the European emission trading system. Many of them, a common complaint was, okay, this is something built for the rich EU 15. It wasn't constructed for us. We had to put it on as a part of joining the European Union. One observer characterized it as an ill-fitting suit for Eastern Europe. 
And so all the dissatisfaction about allocation, what the cap levels were, there's a whole history of all of this. Yet whenever these sources of unhappiness rose to anywhere near a high political level in these countries, they simply were not going to be taken up because whatever the unhappiness about how they were treated in the allocation or in the caps or various other things, uh, that the whatever the cost or whatever the inconvenience of this system was nothing compared to the benefits of the freer movement of capital, labor, and goods that was represented by joining the European Union. As another astute observer said, the EU ETS was just another obligation on the long march to the European Union for us. This was a person from Hungary, that, that, and that's very much the way. But it was those other benefits. They didn't join, they didn't participate because they were convinced of the imperative nature of climate change, although they would readily agree that yes, it's a problem and something would be done, but we have other priorities. But when coupled with these other benefits, the benefits of being parties to the club called the European Union, it was worth accepting this. And there again, on a global level, something more will likely be needed than simply being convinced of the importance of climate change and of doing something about it to persuade nations uh, to come into it. And then last, we see in Europe there have been an effective differentiation of burdens among the participating member states as the stringency of the, of the program uh, has uh, increased. Initially, everyone had a cap that was pretty much at business as usual emissions, therefore not very demanding. But as the cap has increased, it has been, it is moving towards increasing differentiation. And this has been accomplished, as I said before, starting in 2013, there's an EU-wide cap. So there are no national caps. But it was also coupled with moving to auctioning. And that created what were called auctioning rights. And so now the question is, who has the right to auction the allowances that are part of the system? And of course, those then get allocated at the governmental level where this is being negotiated to various governments. And if you think that all the member states of the European Union receive an equal allocation, let's say equal to their emissions in some period during this time, you're totally wrong. That the lower income countries, Romania, Bulgaria, the Baltic states, receive anywhere from 40% to twice as many auction rights relative to 2005 emissions as the richer states of Northwestern Europe. And there are a number of states that fall in between. Now this is sort of well hidden and a bunch of technical formula in the directive, but effectively that people knew what was going on who negotiated uh, the treaty. So let me come now to the path to the future, the one, of the one side of the dichotomy that I oppose, that I have posed. The EU ETS represents, uh, embodies the vision and hopes of the Kyoto Protocol. And yet there's a curious feature about the European emission trading system, which is although it is clearly inspired by the Kyoto Protocol, it is independent of it. It's embedded in European law. When it was enacted, it was not clear that the Kyoto Protocol would enter into force, and it was quite independent. And clearly, I think very few people expect the protocol to extend beyond 2012, and yet we know for sure that the system will. It's become quite independent. It's a bottom-up construction uh, that, uh, and so on, and it is an embrace of trading, ironically, in view of the history of the Kyoto Protocol and European opposition to trading initially, but it got what the Kyoto Protocol got right, there are many things to criticize about, is the vision of the trading regime as being the most promising way forward towards a global climate regime. And essentially, because not only is it efficient, and for a problem of the magnitude that global warming promises to be in terms of dealing with emissions, you need efficient instruments, but also its ability to differentiate burdens inconspicuously. You can think of this, you know, a carbon tax would have the same efficiency attributes if it were uniform. But usually the way you make allowances for equity and different, you know, you differentiate according to circumstances in a tax is somebody gets a lower tax or exemption from the tax. Think of your personal income tax. Uh, and that, of course, destroys the efficiency. Or you could have the uniform tax, but then you'd have intergovernmental transfers. 
So imagine and think of China and the United States or India and the United States. Would China agree to an equal carbon tax with the United States? Maybe with an intergovernmental transfer of the revenues, but would the U.S. take some of its revenues and transfer it explicitly in an intergovernmental transfer to China as a part of burden sharing and differentiated responsibilities, to use the jargon of the framework convention? But they might agree to a uniform price created by a linked system in which China received more allowances or perhaps more auction rights, much as we've seen in Europe, which don't have the same sort of explicitness. They're inconspicuous, they're hidden. Anyone who, they're intergovernmental transfer in the same manner, but they're much less evident and therefore much more politically salient. And the next step, of course, in creating the system was that the, the European Union would link up uh, with, the United, with what was expected to be a U.S. system. And that brings me to the final, the other side of this dichotomy, which is a dead end. We've had a curious development in the U.S., which uh, it's fallen cap and trade and American regulatory innovation has fallen into some disrepute. And I would pose the issue, has it become a cultural issue, like abortion, gun control, stem cells? I mean, how could a wonky or of economist idea take on this stature? I'm not sure that it really has taken on that stature, although here's some of the rhetoric of the opponents, you would think so, although I think many of the advocates are what I would call half-hearted, as I'd say those other cultural issues have full throat supporters on both sides of the issue. And this sort of disrepute is not limited to the federal greenhouse gas proposal that failed in Congress last year. We see it in the demise of the classic canonical SO2 system, the system that inspired all of this. The Knox budget program is dying. Two states and Reggie, the first mandatory CO2 emissions trading program in the United States, the regional, the northeastern, two of the states are talking about pulling out of that. And the Western Climate Initiative, of which California is a part, of course, New Mexico is trying now how to extricate themselves due to an electoral change and a new governor. Uh, and even in California, we find uh, any of you who've been following the legislation there or the litigation now called uh, into question whether it can be implemented on schedule or perhaps at all, but anyway, with, uh, due to uh, legal issues that have arisen. Have arisen. Now, this half-heartedness, I mean, there's a reflection in Europe in some way of what I would argue this sort of half-heartedness or sort of discontent in a way. Europeans are very proud of their system, but if you've been to Europe and you talk to people, you'll find very, very critical of the system also, and there's sort of a, you know, and when you try to get to, has it been effective in limiting emissions, and, and you know, does it work? Uh, they agree that it works, but it's not doing enough. I mean, that would become basically, it hasn't produced the changes that we had anticipated from a price on carbon. And never mind that it's reduced the emissions and so on, but it just has, or it will in the future, uh, but it hasn't re produced the explicit changes, the sort of preconceived ideas of change that we expected. And so you end up, and what we're facing on both sides of the Atlantic, I fear, is the alluring promise of mandates to deliver preconceived results. For the fact is that cap and trade is hard to love, except for, for economists who can appreciate that, yes, all the subtle influences of the pervasive price that stimulates innovation, different ways to produce and things to make the same good so it really doesn't have the same economic effects. But if you have the notion that no, what is required is that we must kill coal or we must move to dramatically different ways of energy use and of leading our lives, then you'll be very disappointed with cap and trade. And you might place your hopes in mandates for doing that. Because and essentially what this is saying is that limiting and reducing emissions isn't enough. And so we're heading, the question that is raised by this is can old time command and control do better? I think our hopes rest in that we'll face a long detour rather than a dead end. 
And that detour, that long detour, <coughs> would consist of the EU persevering with their system despite no one following and it not extending, although there are some very interesting discussions underway with China, between the European Union and China, who is actually talking about on a provincial or sectoral level trading systems that are actually are looking to the European Union on what has been the experience. There's no one else has the experience with an uh, actual CO2 system, but it requires that Europe persevere in this half-heartedness half and they do, do not yield to the allure of the mandates Meanwhile, and the hope of that detour, would the U.S. would return to cap and trade after finding that all of the alternatives are even worse. Thank you very much for your attention, and we're glad to. You said that if you went to Europe before and after 2005, you wouldn't have noticed much of a difference, and right. I, I could say that. Um, so I'm wondering, where, where are these incentives showing up in terms of innovation? I mean, what, are, what is driving the reduction in emissions? Or is this such a small blip that you can't really project? Okay, there have been several, uh, you know, I'd say there are three things I'd point to. One, you've seen in the elect electric utility system, you've definitely seen more utilization of gas than, you've seen, than you would have had of coal. So that's, you've got gas plants and coal plants competing and the difference of price and, you know, what gets dispatched on an electrical system is a matter of mills per kilowatt hour. So, you know, this, and that effect is palpable, has been measured. You've also seen in terms of the investment, I'd say the primary investments have been made are curiously the investments in improving the efficiency of coal-fired power plants. So the heat rate, as we would call it, what the Europeans call the efficiency of the power plants is not God-given. I mean, it varies widely. It depends on how well do you maintain the plants. And companies like Alstom and Siemens have been busy in, in Europe with, and with this price, it makes it worthwhile to improve the heat rate or improve the efficiency of these plants. Now the reduction is only 10, maybe 15 percent, you know, in this, but it's still being done in the UK. I mean, the the largest plant there uh, quite prominently talked about how they're changing out their turbines, putting in new turbines, reblading the turbines that would improve the efficiency by 10 percent uh, in their plant. So that's a that's not an insignificant reduction of emissions. Again, it's not 50 percent, and it's not going to be that, but that's starting off. And we've seen in steel industry, in cement industry, changes in terms of how basically changes in the you know, manner of producing it that have uh, come about because there are alternatives of how to produce the same quality of cement or the same steel with uh, fairly slight changes in the production process. But what we really don't know is how much, you know, I, I think the cost effects, they weren't done before because it was too costly. But the cost effects, I think, probably get drowned out again because it's just, you know, one single price. But those would be three examples, I would say, of. About a year ago, there was a publication about the um, comparing carbon tax versus emission trading. Um, they use the um, the um, agent-based model and simulate, you know, which trajectory would uh, result in a bit better outcome. And their conclusion was that carbon tax generally result in a better outcome, despite the um, you know general uh, right. findings in other uh, you know in, in um, environment economics. The reasoning is that, well, carbon tax give very clear idea for business right. how much of the uh, you know additional cost involved in their business will be so that they can readjust their, themselves to their profit maximizing um, um, practice. Whereas emission trading sort of let the, the business speculate what will be the price trajectory uh, in the future so that some of them will undercapacitate and some of them will overcapacitate so that there will be some suboptimality in, in their uh, behavior so that the uh, overall outcome uh, will be less favorable. So what is your reflection in, in this discussion? Okay, I guess the, it, it is a point that's commonly made. And uh, so the argument is here that we want a fixed price, that a fixed price, all else being equal, will, let's say, uh, cause more investment than a, you know, uh, let's say an equivalent expected price that we might see. We expect some variation uh, uh, around that. 
perhaps, I, I, I mean, we see all around us investments made. I mean, huge investments. You can think of offshore platforms and things on a price that isn't fixed. And there are a variety of ways in financial markets to hedge, to deal with that. And then, you know, the structure of corporations is to deal with those sort of uncertainties. So whether, you know, is there some edge greater, you know, for if you have an absolutely fixed price, you're also coming into the issue of the ability of governments to commit. Uh, in the long future. So we may say, you know, our goal is 80% reduction by 2050, but does anybody really believe that that issue would never be revisited, that Congress today, for instance, could commit to what the emissions will be in 2050? I don't think so. And, I, and what we've seen, one of the features of the European system has been that they have actually adapted and changed their system in response to events, which is quite encouraging. So it doesn't just, you know, nobody will touch it and it sort of goes off, off the road. and in some manner. So I think the, the problem, you know, a tax would be wonderful. And I think the real issues here become the much perhaps overdone political feasibility of the tax. But I think also, to my mind, it's fundamentally the issue, how do you differentiate in a multinational context? So we're talking about a global system. So how do you differentiate globally? Are those intergovernmental transfers, we need all the efficiency we can get. But to differentiate, if you're going to have a global tax, you need to have intergovernmental transfers that are explicit. That's going to be a lot harder to arrange than surreptitiously, if I may use that word, but I'd prefer to say inconspicuously, <laughs> to arrange the transfer in some way that very few people recognize as being that is actually a function of the market. Just like we transfer lots of money to you know, China or India or other countries to purchase whatever goods that they can produce more cheaply than we can. And so this just becomes one more, and it's the result of decentralized agents looking for the cheapest sort of thing. And it, it seems all very plausible. And, and in effect, it gets set up, the transfer gets set up by agreement among governments who know what they're doing, but it doesn't have the same political salience. And I, I think that's where the superiority of the cap and trade and the promise. I mean, if we could do those transfers, if you can deal with differentiation, or let's say countries like India and China don't care about differentiation and they would feel it would be equitable for the Japan, the US, Europe, for them to assume the same burdens as, as us, then okay, fine, you could go with it. But I just don't think that's the world we live in. With the uh, question of offsets, the two limitations were a 13% uh, limitation and then CDMJI. Do you think that uh, more could be accomplished if the offsets were opened up to anywhere and particularly within the countries themselves? Because here in California, for example, we have the um, uh, environmental justice um, you know, lobby saying we want the reductions near the facilities. So that uh, limitation seems to be um, uh, unnecessary to me because if CDM is really the least cost, the market would find it anyway. I, w I would quite agree. I mean, I quite agree with you that you, you presumably the, the ideal for an offset regime would be you have tough criteria that have to be met and no restrictions, and particularly for climate. I mean, you don't care where the emissions are. Uh, in the European system, in fact, joint implementation does occur within the European system outside of the sector. I mean, it's a very controversial, but in theory it's allowed. And there are several of the countries are indeed exploring where they're doing a reduction in the residential sector to get JI credits that could then be used in the European system. This is a number of baseline problems because of the Kyoto uh, limits and so on. But uh, that, that could be done. I, I mean, I, I think the political realities, I mean, we have this fear of offsets swamping the system. And it, it comes in, in all the US legislation, that's the way it's set up. Uh, you know, I, I wish we could get away from that and just say, look, it's the integrity that counts. And so we don't care where they come from, what they are, just so they're real and they're additional and so on. But, that seems to be the way. The, the more we can widen that up, so much the better. The European choice of the Kyoto mechanisms was because they were part of the Kyoto Protocol, and it had the beneficial effect of making the European price the world price. So, I, I mean, that if you go out and CDM or everything, I mean, the CDM would be a pale shadow of what it is today if the European system had not created a price of 20 euros. It'd be very much weaker, much less not viewed as a, a success, uh, you know, whatever. So.
So I think the more you widen it up, the better. And I think the interesting feature of what we're observing in Europe is, you know, the, the limit is not fully subscribed, despite the fact that from a rational economic standpoint, everybody would do that. Even if you had more allowances than you needed for your emissions, you'd swap them out. I mean, sell the EUAs that sell for three euros more than CDM credits and use the CDM credits up to your full 13%. But, you know, clearly that's not being done. Uh, I, I don't have a good explanation for that. That's one of the research topics I'm working on. But I think it shows that perhaps these fears of the offset swamping the system are really overblown. It doesn't occur. And in fact, for most other cap and trade systems have offset provisions, but they're very little utilized because of transaction cost, uh, you know, other issues. I was struck by your comment about old-fashioned command and control. And doesn't that just suggest that the cap needs to be tightened? Well, you, you could. So let's say that is a political issue. I mean, one of the problems of cap and trade, I find, is it's too explicit. Uh, and so, but I would also argue it's more effective in reducing emissions than the old-fashioned command and control, where you have a lot of hoopla about adopting the amendment, and then, and it's typically sort of a uniform standard that then has to be applied in a world of tremendous cost heterogeneity. And so what happens is, so we have people for whom the standard isn't particularly demanding, others for whom it imposes extraordinary cost, and for them, they always come in for some sort of relief. And arguably, they should receive it because, you know, their plant, whatever a reason, but the, the relaxation is always one-sided. No one ever comes in and says, this is really easy for me, you ought to tighten the sand for me, and the regulator doesn't know for whom it's easy. What this system does is say, okay, it's up to you guys to figure this out, and the market actually works that out. So the one that has cheap abatement costs actually does a lot more because it pays him to do that to supply the other, which you'd like to do if you had an omniscient, omnipotent, regulator who, you know, uh, all of, or the world were aver all was average or homogeneous, but it isn't. So I think that's the issue. So it's easy to appear tough with command and control. It isn't as easy with cap and trade, uh, but, you know, this is testing the political, because the, the real tightness of the command and control, that's why I said the alluring promise. I mean, whether command and control delivers these expected results can be questioned. And I would say, you know, I, I don't think it does. If you match the rhetoric with what actually happens, I think it's it much less so than what you see in cap and trade.